Very good morning, folks, and welcome to FYI. And FYI, I have a cohort this morning. Folks, we are welcoming back Tabitha, who is going to be with us for a couple of days. I'm helping to pick up some of the slack. Do let us know if you're hearing us loud and clear. Uh, folks who are joining us this morning, we're seeing all our tubers, all the folks on um, on YouTube, on LinkedIn, the folks who are joining us on Twitter, uh, Facebook, can't leave out Facebook. Um, Tabitha, good morning and welcome back. Good morning to you, Mr. Duncan. It's good to be back. Good morning to your viewers. I know some of you may have missed me. <laughs> so guys, here... let us know. <laughs> guys, let us know if you're hearing us loud and clear. Don't want Tabitha to waste the word. Go ahead, Tabitha. <laughs> I'm just saying it's good to be back. It's good to be back. I've been absent for a while, and um, I think it's good. You know, we should see what happens over the next two weeks. <laughs> what you're able to accomplish. Excellent. Excellent. So y'all, y'all heard that, folks. We were trying to be on time this morning, but we couldn't get, we couldn't get some of the things we wanted to get in um, working correctly, and we wanted to make sure that you were hearing us um, relatively clearly, and at least you were seeing us uh, for some part relatively clearly. We got a lot to get through this morning because we want to give you all the time, right? You know, you, you're talking about give give them back the time as though you know these people pay us and they partner with us and all of that. But we 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 want to be fair. We promise an hour. <laughs> yeah, they didn't have an hour. We're give an hour. <laughs> right? We're gonna give it. Tell me, how did you spend? How did you spend uh, yesterday? Which was which was Agua? How did you spend yesterday? I re I had a, a relaxing day. I must say I didn't leave the house. Um, I just relaxed at home. Um, today is actually my daughter's birthday, so I was getting her ready for the day today. So I spent the day doing that yesterday. Wow, you know, good for you, good for you. Um, you don't have to get the hair done, and you know, so prepare her so she looks nice and all of those things. So that's excellent. How old is she turning today? She's gonna be six. She no, she is six today. She is six today. Wow, that's that's a big girl. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. So she woke up and early this morning, ready for the day. <laughs> as, as any child would, knowing that tomorrow is the birthday and all of the attention is going to be on them. Folks, wherever you're joining us from, remind us if you're hearing us loud and clear. We did have a couple of challenges, and that's why we off to a rather late start. Uh, Tabitha's first day back with us for the next two weeks or so, two, three, four weeks or so. <laughs> Dolly, good to see you there. Uh, Tracy, good to see you. Lyndon Gill um, and all the other folks. Donna George is here. Donna Daly is here with us. Uh, great to have you guys uh, on with us this morning. Uh, and uh, Vashti and the others saying they're hearing us loud and clear. Good morning, Vashti. Magnot, Vashti and Rupert always join us right uh, out of on, Ontario. <laughs> Better way to call it. Ontario, Ontario. Good morning, Hazel and Debbie. I call in for me and Tabitha. Uh, and all the other folks joining us this morning. Guys, welcome to our broadcast. Tabby, it's so good to have you back. It's good to be here. I, I know, you know, it's always good when you can have somebody to speak with and you're not doing it alone. So any chance that I correct, can. Correct, correct, correct. Any chance that I um, can, I, I'll try to assist you as much as possible. And you're doing such a good job with Sharon. Esther, Emerson, on, all the on. others. I just want to take some time to let Sherrod Duncan know that we see what he's doing. We admire what he's doing. And he's, you know, he does so much. If you see what goes on behind the scenes to make this done, to get this to you, I think you would want to show him with a lot of thanks, you know, because he's bringing the news to you in a different way, in a way that you don't get other places. And, you know, Sherrod, good job. Job well done. Keep pushing. It's not always easy. Um, there are a lot of sacrifices that goes with it, but just keep it going because you're doing an awesome job. And uh, yeah, what do you think, uh, man? Thank you for you know you were born to do I this. I tend part. to freeze up a little bit when people start talking about me, and I'm in the room because <laughs> sometimes you don't know where to go. Tabby, <laughs> I was at um, I was at Korea Day, UG, our alma mater, and um, Dr. Mohammed. Uh, I was at the opening ceremony. I just there minding my own basis. I hear Dr. Mom said, Sherrod Duncan. Is that Sherrod Duncan? <laughs> well, well, I freeze up. She said, um, famous sir, infamous Sherrod Duncan. It depends on where you 
Oh, Should be told, Dr. Dr. Muhammad was my thing, director. Ma, you your thing, and, and I know that it will grow and it will be a success. That vision and that. goal that you have, it will, it, it, will, it will be a success. Amen to that. You know, when we started the morning program, we had about 40, 50 persons, the faithful, <laughs> with us. And now on an average morning, about 1,500 persons watch us live. And then by the end of the day, it's about 10, 10, 10,000 persons uh, watch us, which we're grateful for. And that's where we're committed. Um, and we're happy that you can be a part of that too, Tabby, helping to bring valid and credible information to our citizenry, whether home or abroad, because there's so much misinformation that flies about there any given day, Tabby. There's so much yeah. misinformation. I can only try to keep up with you, Cheryl. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Folks, let's, let's, let's get right to it. Um, I'm not here for my looks, Tabitha, perhaps, but I'm not here for my looks. So let's let's get right into it. Uh, the first 15 things we think you ought to know about as we start the day today, and we're starting we're starting regionally. Uh, Tabitha, the mayor of Ecuador, one of the cities in Ecuador, one of the youngest mayors there, overnight, I think we saw this on the weekend, uh, was found uh, shot to death with one of our assistants in a car. I know international relations is one of the things in politics largely uh, that you taught at UG, you were a lecturer student, you just run the gamut of things there. You got your master's and a whole bunch of things. And you know more about these subject matters than I do. Uh, but, you know, Ecuador and lots of Latin American countries have been having a tough time with crime, like Guyana. But it's, it, it, it's not something that is new. Um, I, I won't say specifically to Ecuador, but a lot of the Latin American countries, uh, they suffer, you know, there's this um, issue with politics and crime and who should be in control and who should be in charge of, of a society or, or even this part of township. Um, and it's so sad when, you know, at this level of, you know, mayorship, we don't know what caused, caused that particular crime to happen. So we can't go more further than what we know. But, you know, all these, these things, as you know, should be an indication that we should not take things for granted. And, and we should always, one, um, keep our security um, professional. Uh, that's one. Um, so that they can uh, do what is required to, to, to find justice and to get justice for those persons who ha have died. But on the other side, as well as politicians, we have to ensure that we're doing what is right. Um, and so they're both sides, you're not sure where, where, where this will end up. But you always want you ensure that you're doing what is right, what is just. And on the other side, ensure that the security system has what it's required to keep us safe and also to bring justice when things like this happen. Correct is right. So it's it's really a lot, um, you know, just trying to just trying to cover um, that is that is happening. But we trying to make just trying to make the best of it. And that's just one of the things that we're tracking that has happened uh, overseas within as, as as many days. As I said, um, this is among one of those uh, things that we kind of looking at. Look at this other one here. Um, uh, uh, well, on a, on a happier note, in a sense. Uh, we've been watching the Amazon rainforest. There have been lots of concern. I spent part of the day yesterday watching some um, documentaries on National Geographic that speaks to uh, global warming and what's happening in the world today. Um, and we're losing our rainforest. You know, the, the, um, the, 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 the polar caps are melting. It's a whole bunch of stuff happening. Macron had some very sharp criticisms for... Uh, the management of the Amazon rainforest, as you know, we call it the lungs of, of the world. Um, and he's visiting that quite shortly uh, there in Brazil, Tabitha. He's going to be visiting thoughts, if any. <laughs> not much, but I, no, I think it's something that we need to take stock of on, on our, in, in, in Guyana as well, right? Because the Amazon basin sort of runs through a number of the countries in South America, including Guyana. Um, and so in Guyana too, I think we need to take stock of what it is that we are doing uh, and ensuring that, yes, we know that we do a lot in terms of carbon credits here, but as we develop, uh, as we try to go into manufacturing and stuff like that, we need to also ensure that we're doing what we can to also help to keep our environment safe, um, to reduce the, 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 the negative aspects that would come with, with uh, development and with manufacturing. Uh, um, as we develop as a country. So um, let's see what happens once he gets to Brazil. Um, if it is that he just, he just, he's coming to see 
or he's coming to make further investment because a lot of what happens is that they talk big on the international stage of what they want to do, of where they want to get to by 2030, um, the, the, you know, and how much they're willing to invest in ensuring that our forests remain um, strong and vibrant. But then when it comes to actually doing it, we see a lot of people cover. Um, and it's, so it's just a lot of big talks and nothing actually substantial comes out of it. So we'll see what happens once he gets to Brazil. Yeah, so we're looking at that, folks, and we're looking also at, I think we, we're now coming in a little closer. Um, uh, look at this one here. This is also, as we're in Brazil, uh, this is also what's happening, what's featuring in Brazil. Um, let me make sure that I have it right. Yeah, take a look at that, folks. This is uh, the Brazilian, uh, former Brazilian President Jair Bolsonaro, apparently a couple um, a couple days ago, when his passport was seized, he spent a couple mornings, as we see, at the um, at the Hungarian embassy in Brazil. Because this seems to have a lot of action. Like, we're not capturing all of it um, quite well on a daily basis. But again, a former president having to spend, um, this is like, let's say, Bar Jagdio. You, you know, something happened, he gets afraid. He said, well, I can clock in a little bit by the Brazilian embassy or the Mexican embassy locally here. That is not a normal routine to have a leading um, political figure in your country, you know, spending a night or two at some embassy in your own country. You know, somebody, Tabby? somebody thought he needed a timeout. <laughs> he, needed, he needed some time to take stock of himself and what he was, what he did in Brazil over the time he was president. Um, but this is an interesting, um, this is very interesting because you're in your own country. Um, and so is it the case that there is a warrant out for his arrest and he is trying to leave? What exactly is going on in Brazil that the former president has to hide out in a Hungarian embassy in their own country? So that's something I think we should dig deep into to see what exactly um, they, is, is, is the deal with Bolsonaro and whether the state has decided to try to hold him accountable for the, the number of atrocities that happened under him, especially where COVID is concerned and the amount of people that died under his watch. All right. Folks, I see Marlon telling us that the comments aren't showing. Marlon, well, I don't know, my sister, how to help in that regard. The comments aren't showing. That's why we say we've been migrating to YouTube because Facebook, any given day you turn up to Facebook, is something. But good to see Kamal Passat, a former Region 7 vice chair, was on the live this morning. Chanel Wilson is on the live with us too. Um, yep, yeah, and Marlon wants to know what Bill Clinton, former U.S. president, is doing in Guyana. Well, I can tell you. <laughs> <laughs> the most that I know is that he was invited by the Dominican Republic um, um, ambassador. Correct uh, is right. Oh, so I can tell you. As, <laughs> as Marlon took us in that direction, um, Andrew Griffith says, personal investment. Uh, Horace Carlos says, you look beautiful, Tabby. Right, you, you very beautiful. <laughs> right, you know we started the program in a rush. So I haven't had a chance to really, you know. <laughs> but thank, thank you very much, uh, <laughs> Mr. Calder, <laughs> Horace. Thank you very much. I, 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 I'm, I'm certain I was smiles. She acquiesced. She said yes. She said, it's true. <laughs> thank you, sir. Lou and Hall, and all the other folks who are joining us this morning. Let's turn our attention, folks. Some what's happening at at home, as um. As what's your name took us in that direction? Marlin, Marlin Thomas took us in that direction. Jackson, Bill Clinton. What a day it was yesterday as we were talking. A very, a very colorful day. And I just love, I just love how Guyanese, you know, come together and celebrate these holidays. We need no government to really tell me but one Guyana, you know, right? If anything, this is the government that creates the strife and the friction and the, the politics gets in the way. We know how to do it in perspective. Of that, and as per normal, Guyanese came together across ethnicities and whatever political differences and so on. Yesterday was Pagua and had a fantastic time, saving except a particular PP councillor in Alexander Village, apparently, Tabitha. Yeah, that, that was shock. When I read it, I was quite shocked. At, and then I saw the video. And this first, please introduce what happened before we start to talk. <laughs> you were shook at, you were shook at. But apparently he was brandishing, I'm sorry we don't have the video queued, uh, queued up, 
when he was brandishing apparently a firearm, Tabitha. Yes, he was apparently you know? upset because somebody was parked in front of his gate or something and he was trying to get in. And the way in which, as a counselor, he thought it was best to deal with it was to walk down the street with firearm in hand, hoping to figure out who it is that was um, parked in front of him. And I don't know if he understood that that would make his situation worse because whoever it was, was very would, not go, by that. would not identify themselves because you have a firearm in your hand, which is suggesting that you're about to assault somebody. So um, I, th I think sometimes we take the little, very little power that we have, it goes to our heads in a way that, you know, it's it's, it's almost sick. So I'm, I'm waiting to see how the police will, re will, will deal with this matter. I was very, very struck by that, um, especially as it was a day where, I'm trying to get the notes right, where um, uh, uh, Irfan Ali uh, was talking about national unity and peace and uh, taking from the season. I think you got to start, charity begins at home. Maybe you got to start pulling in line because this is a region four, they tell us, uh, RDC councillor, right? Let us see, you know, in this little small regard, this little hanging foot you have, some course correction. Maybe we can start by maybe um, seizing his firearm, um, revoking his license. I saw this gun waving and we're going to we, we're gonna show you guys that footage later on. There, there, there are children there, of course, because this is Pagua in uh, Alexander Village. And he's waving this firearm around the place. We see this, um, we see this, uh, we, we, we hear a gunshot um, fired off and, and, and all of that. I mean, like, what's happening here, Taffy? It, it, it's, it's sickening, but I am like you waiting to see how it is dealt with by, by the police um, because I know it was reported to the police station that is um, closest to um, Alexander Village. So we wait to see and we'll see whether or not what... Um, Gail said at the at, at, at her meeting the other day, whether it's true or not. But she was, you know, she was trying to defend all of the things that were wrong. <laughs> Might think that they were not wrong, as it relates to the Ghana police force and their their involvement in their activities. So let's see how it is that they, they deal with this matter here. Yeah, well, yeah, I see she gotta go back before the UN Rights Committee. Um, quite shortly, and on that note, Tabitha, as we're talking about the UN and that, that whole rights committee there, you know, last week, folks, you all know we went through um, almost painstakingly, uh, yes, lots of the issues that came up before uh, that UN Human Rights Committee, um, and the government was taken to task. Not that the, uh, the rights committee, the human rights committee there, to me, had any agenda. They were just doing their work. I think they meet every eight years now every five years from this last meeting here so they had a lot to they, they had a lot to go on um this is a government that likes to say everything bad is up new afc they don't like to stand by their record anything good though that's why we saw mr john you know, uh, we know like a thief in plain sight going back to the 2015 record of the uh the up new afc um, and they raise in teachers pay and say, oh, look how much you all got since 2015. In this sh shameless, Tabby, shameless, shameless, shameless. What are your thoughts, one, with what transpired over the last uh, week or so? It was three days of meetings. And, um, and uh, you know, the, 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 the plight that they found themselves in. Tabitha, right up your alley. Well, <laughs> I am... Um... Well, one, I was happy that the, the, the committee was able to ask the, the questions of, 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 the, of Gail Teixeira. Um, I was not really surprised by the responses because when you know you're doing something that is wrong, you have two choices. You either admit or find things to say that suggest it's either not you or you don't know what they're talking about. Um, and so knowing that they would not admit any of their wrongdoings or any of the things that are not, not going right, um, to try to figure out how to change course and to correct, correct certain things that are going wrong, then the only option they have is to pretend, one, nothing is happening, and two, then try to blame somebody else for their misdeeds. And so we saw a lot of that throughout the three days. Um, I don't know how they're going to deal with it behind the scenes once they once. Um, now that the meeting is over, but I see that they, they, they decided they have to send further information to, to the committee, hoping that that would resolve some of the questions that they, that they had of, uh, of them. But at the bottom line is, Cheryl, that we here in Guyana know the truth. 
Um, I think the people on the committee know the truth and they were just trying to get a sense from them whether or not they're willing to recognize that there are some flaws in the system and there are some flaws in the way in which they're dealing with issues in the system. Um, and the bottom line is they seem not to care and they're not interested in reversing course and they're going to continue um, on the direction that they're currently on. Um, and so it's a case that everybody knows. Now it will be international because once the, the committee um, finishes its report, they're going to send it out to a lot of nations, a lot of countries who will um, now have access. If, and they, know, they also have access on the, on the website, but they're going to formally send a report to countries um, helping them to get a sense of what is going on in Guyana and the different in the different sectors. And so um, the PP thought that they were in, in Google, so to speak, because they weren't yeah. hearing a lot of stuff. And now they're realizing that a lot of what we are complaining about here didn't just stay here, but it got to the international level. And so kudos to all of those Guyanese who actually um, sent in information, who actually gave evidence, gave evidence, and spoke to the issues. And it's not political persons. Some political persons may have sent stuff as well. But there are a lot of civil society organizations that are working behind the scene um, when things come up, when things are going wrong, and they would have sent those information into the UN um, a Human Rights Committee. And so that is what we saw um, unfold over the last uh, couple of days last week. And so kudos to those persons, and let's see where it leads us. Yeah, apparently they want you to, um, as they say, to suhawe them. you got to put on a mala. They don't like criticism, mm -hmm. and I think the fact that uh, Parliament, thanks to uh, Mr. Uh, Mansour, the deer, uh, you know, happens in such a haphazard um, way. They're not accustomed to the kind of scrutiny because he's always shielding them. Uh, last week, we, we 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 examined a letter from the editor from Shamshun Mohammed, and today we saw uh, GHK Lal writing a similar letter to the press. Shamshun Mohammed, I don't know him, a citizen, took the position that. You know, governors should look at what the committee is saying and try to correct some of these things, not trying to find out who made the report so you can victimize them. Correct course, correct course. You know, the 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 the, um, the human rights committee said that they, uh, you know, fact check. Lots of what was reported to the committee, they've had time to do that. They laid out the mythology, literally laid out the mythology of which they write that these questions and so on to put to the government. And they want to know who submitted the, the report. They don't want the content, you know. Give us the author so they can go and victimize. But, you know, um, as J.H.K. Lal pointed out in, in, uh, in, in this morning's papers, that this has created some hysteria in the PPP. But it must be hysteria that leads to positive change. Nothing going to victimize people, Tabitha. But this is, seems to be, you know, the people. Yeah, the, the, I don't think anything will change, um, um, Cheryl. I think they will try to find new ways to cover up um, as much as possible what is going wrong um, mm -hmm. because they thrive in a society that um, does wrong. They thrive in a society where they are in control um, and where they have complete control of every aspect of society. And that means not um, going by the rule of law. Um, and so I don't expect any um, change in course. Um, but I also think that what is important for Guyanese to recognize is that, one, uh, all of this spending of money, for example, because you see a lot of people coming here. Yes, Bill Clinton is here, former President Bill Clinton is here now. Um, we had the, uh, a, a lot of senior persons from around the world are, are you know, are landing in Guyana. And the people, they, they dole out the, the food, you know, they have a blast. If you see the, the, the pictures. You see evidence that they're doing a lot to make people feel as though Guyana is doing well and everybody loves them and everything is. And then the Human Rights Committee just lets them recognize that, yeah, yeah. You come give us nice food and make the place look nice. But we recognize what is going on on the ground in society. And as much as you want to dole out the money and make the place look nice and put on a mask, the reality is that things are really dirty on the ground and you need to clear it up if it is that you want to be seen as a credible um, government. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we, we, we're following that too. Um, as we on the UN, we saw also uh, last week into the weekend, this uh, resolution come up concerning uh, peace between the Israelis and Palestine and what's happening there uh, on, on the Gaza Strip, Tabi. Um, 
Ghana initially voted to abstain, and we heard some um, we heard some explanation out of the UN ambassador or the Ghana ambassador to the UN, Carolyn Rodriguez. Um, you know on what on what was happening there and why they went in that direction. But the UN managed to finally adopt this resolution demanding an immediate ceasefire. Um, uh, well, Gaza ceasefire and lots of stuff happening there. Humanitarian issues. I mean, I thought we had a better way of solving problems, but here we are yet again. Well, I, I, I'm not sure how to respond to this particular issue, Sheila. Um, on the one hand, I on I when I heard the the response given uh, from our UN rep on what why it is that they voted the way they voted, I tried to figure out why it was not in no why an abstain. Um, if you thought that this was not the best course of action, abstaining suggests that you really don't have a view on it. It not it, it normally suggests that you don't really have a stake in this, that you don't have a view on it, that you're not. Um, and so you're not parting yourself to the vote. Um, and so if it is that you, you were so against the approach and the fact that it was uh, um, it didn't have a lot of uh, uh, parts that you thought should have been added to the particular, uh, then, then you should have voted no. So I, was, I would have uh, loved to have a conversation with her to figure out why abstain and not no at that particular time. But as you see, it did go through. Um, so I, I don't know what... <laughs> With, with with these um these situations, these international organizations, things can change so quickly. And when you find out what caused it to change is not something that is very, you know, intellectual. It's usually other things that cause people to change their votes as well. So I'm not sure how I want to, you know, how I should respond to what has happened. But with everything that is happening in the Gaza Strip, I think um, something has to be done. I don't think that we should stay on the sidelines, whatever the situation is, um, that we need to figure out as a community, as an international community, not just Guyana, um, that we need to figure out a solution that works uh, because it's never good to see children and, you know, and, and dying and, 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 and families just disappear because of this ongoing tumultuous a uh, relationship between uh, the, the Palestinians and the Israelites. I think uh, we should, in the 21st century, be able to find some form of way to deal with all the situations and be very frank and clear about it. This is not something that happened in 1940. This is historical, um, as, as, as old as biblical times, and we need to figure it out or else it will just continue. It will just continue. Correct is right. And, you know, one of the things that we've been following mm -hmm. here Lots of commentators uh, say, well, thought that the two-state solution was dead, but it seems to be back on the table, as you know, you've been saying, uh, you know, we have to figure out. That seemed to be one of the things uh, that high up on the agenda, and that we saw the U.S. recently proposing as well, this two-state solution to solve this bitterness and rancor and years, years, decades of animosity between the, the Palestinians and the Israelis as you know, just one of those things. And as we on on that, one of the things that struck me here, this whole issue of the of the uh, of the of, of our country abstaining, um, is the fact that you always have to find out things by the way. If you got somebody who knows somebody, who knows somebody who been there and see and hear what happened, you would never hear from the administration. And that takes us in the other direction of what's happening also, what we've been hearing. Uh, concerning the recruitment of uh, foreign healthcare workers. Now, Tabi, I really want to know where you are here. Overnight, we heard that over 700 um, Bangladeshis are going to be hired to fill a lot of um, spaces in the local health sector. Tabi, I know a lot of nurses raising some eyebrows here. Sure, this is an issue on, uh, on a number of different levels. One, we had, I don't know if you remember the, 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 the president, Irfan Ali, almost lambasting a UK journalist about the fact that the yeah. UK Quite is recently. taking all the nurses. Why are you taking our nurses? So, and we know why the nurses are leaving. They're leaving because their conditions of work is, you know, it's horrible. And they, they deserve more and they're getting more and better elsewhere. And so I think on the one hand that 
uh, we need to first look at why it is that our nurses are leaving the country. And if it is that we can do what is required to ensure that they stay here, then we make uh, it our duty to ensure our people do not leave and so that we have to go looking for persons elsewhere. Well, now you look at the fact that one, <clears throat> even in his response, the foreign minister said that um, a, a lot of Cubans are actually taking up some of the positions. And so nobody from Bangladesh has, has actually been, um, has actually arrived in Guyana as yet. Has, has, yeah, the, the reality is that where the Cubans are concerned, I'm sure they're very good um, and nurses and doctors. I know of quite a few Cubans who are very good doctors. Um, but the reality is that there's a language barrier that a lot of people have to face once they get into the hospitals because they're speaking um, their language, which is Spanish, and they're trying to speak English. And there is that barrier that, uh, you know, could cause people to lose their lives, could cause people to get medication that they shouldn't get. And, and if you don't understand what the nurses and doctors are saying to you, that could be a serious issue in our health sector. Then third, what exactly is the condition? Are persons coming and they're being they're being paid? Yes. Are they also being paid? Uh, are they giving free housing? Um, what of their families? Are the families coming here free as well? Do we have to take care of their families? Now, what is the cost for one person coming to Guyana? What is that total cost? And would it not be more beneficial for us to utilize that money to ensure our nurses get better in Guyana uh, instead of trying to recruit persons? If we were really interested, we would have had a drive to make sure our nurses come back home with the right um, conditions, under the right circumstances. So we have Guyanese serving Guyanese who understand our society, who understand our people, who understand the context in which people are coming to the hospital and so can better be able to guide them as to their health their health matters. Um, I think it, it, it's just sickening that instead of doing all you can to first hire people from the diaspora, hire Guyanese that are, and we have shared, we have nurses all across the length and breadth of this world who are doing phenomenal things where they are. And if it is that we're really interested about our health sector, then that is where we would focus on first, rather than trying to find persons from Bangladesh I have no problems with Bangladeshi people. I do not know them. They may be very good nurses where they are, but they do not understand our Guyanese context. And to bring them in here in our um, society at this particular point, when we have other options that are closer to home, I think it's, it's, it, 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 it tells where the mindset of the, of, of, of the people is. Yep. So there is that, Tabby. And I, I'm happy you, you mentioned it. And I, saw, I see Elizabeth Narain has joined the conversation. She says, I'm raising several eyebrows because most of these people are not qualified in our governing body. The Ghana Nursing Council is not allowed to question the government and these persons are not registered. So my question is, what system will be in place to ensure that they are registered nurses in the system? You know, the other thing that I'm fascinated by, about a year ago, we saw the, the closure, the demolishing of the um, the, the uh, Charles Rosa Nursing School in Linden because the government said we had too many nurses, you know, too many nurses in Region 10. And so they shut down that. But then we saw them proposing a nursing school in Region 6, one in Region 3. Nine. Quite surprisingly, and now you're saying you are affected um, in the health sector because you have you don't have, you know, the requisite amount of nurses. It's quite interesting how the people plan, how they govern, um, how they administer very um you know lack lack but, it's, but what they and they do this all the time they create a problem they create the problem exacerbate the problem and then try to come oh they have the solution to the problem and the solution to the problem is always worse it's not usually a helpful solution it's always a solution that causes you to raise your eyebrows it causes you to question why how why now? Why not something else? It's never a solution that all Guyanese could say, ah, oh, this makes sense. Let's go this route. The solution always comes with some eyebrows raised because you're wondering what is going on behind the scene that would cause you to think that this is the best approach given the circumstances that we are in. And so it, 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 it happens throughout all of the sectors. The health sector is going to take a hit. Yes, there are a lot more... Um, uh, uh, hospitals coming on board a lot more um health facilities coming on board but if it is that you know that this is your concern then you put systems in place our unemployment hasn't gone down our unemployment has not gone down what systems are you putting in place to ensure 
that the young people are coming out of school and going into fields that where they would get a job and get you know well-paying jobs instead of saying that you bring in somebody from Bangladesh. You bring yeah. people from Bangladesh, our unemployment will, will remain high, and then you will say, well, oh, shucks. We just hired 500 people, and the 500 people are not Guyanese. But you're going to put it down that you hired 500 people. And the best that you can yeah. give us, not saying anything wrong with call centers, because we need call centers, but then only thing that you're looking at is providing call centers for Guyanese. I think we need yeah. to do better. I think Guyanese need to recognize that this, the PVP, they're not really interested in developing the human capacity. They may say so. They have gold, 20,000 gold um, scholarships they give away, but still they need to go and hire 500 people and 700 people from Bangladesh. Out of those 20,000 scholarships, they don't have nurses, enough nurses to fill our system. They said uh, one, of these, one of these programs that they're running through, through Coursera is, um, I think, an assistant nursing program. Because that's going to be interesting. <laughs> that's going to be a lot of tea. A lot of theory happening there, but the practice, my God. So, you know, it's a lot. Just when you think about it, um, this part-time job program that they have, you got people who might, you, you, you know, you might got a school with a staff of 50, five of teachers, four to five is part-time workers, you know, cleaning board, emptying bins and so on. And you, 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 you telling me that we got too many nurses here. That's why you close the child's rose the nursing school. We know it's more than that. We beg, but we got sense. Um, you're opening nursing schools, other places. You got the young people languishing, you know, for a 10 day job when the month comes. You're bringing 500 workers to give them, you know, full time employment. On what salary, right? Free housing and all of that. We can't even treat our own Guyanese people good. You know, when I thought about this earlier, Tabitha, I remember that prophecy of. Um, the Barbadian Prime Minister, Mayor Martley, that we're going to be tenants in our own country. Right? We're going to be tenants in our own country. It's just fascinating to watch the whole thing unfold. Tammy? Yeah, I just hope that you see what is really happening and they don't um, turn a blind eye to what is really before us as a country. And whether or not PP really has the interest of Guyanese at heart or they're just interested in trying to plug holes um and put square pegs in round holes where they could have better solutions that would benefit all of Guyana and all Guyanese. If it is that you have a proper plan, a proper strategy that deals with development, you want to um increase your, your health system, you want to have more um hospitals, you want to have more um health facilities across the country, then you put systems in place to ensure that you have nurses to fill the capacity that will be there in two, three, four years. That is what you do. Uh, and it's not that we don't. I, I, I'm the first to say, Cheryl, that at some point we will need persons in the country. We don't have enough people in our country to deal with what will come as a society. And so time will come for that. But unless Guyanese are at the point where they can say, well, yes, I am comfortable. Yes, I can get a job when I graduate from university, when I graduate from nursing school, and I'm graduating from nursing school with the complement of, of, of the knowledge that is required to do well in, in the health sector. Once Guyanese reach that level, then you say, well, you know what? We have reached our capacity as, as a society in terms of filling the gaps. And so we may need some assistance elsewhere, but that is not what is happening. And so we can't say that, you know, we need people especially when our unemployment numbers are so high. I Correct. think it's a slap in the face of all the nurses that would have had to leave to find betterment elsewhere, and to the Guyanese society who will have to deal with persons who do not understand them, understand the society, and, and, and have to now try to figure out what they're saying when you go to get some help, some help in the health sector. Yeah. You know what, what, what um, kind of pleased me here too? The fact that, again, we didn't find this out directly from the government. The only time you hear from Irfan is when it comes to abuse, all the teachers or so on. Yeah. Venezuela and our borders, you know, doing a lot of stuff. Um, I ain't seen you no know, life with that. You know, here's an opportunity for you to come and articulate with this country where the country is going, what the needs are, and where do you think we need to be heading to yes. fulfill those needs, to fill the gaps and all that. Yeah. Right? But like a thief in the night, now they come out saying that to prevent, um, I saw uh, Hugh Todd, the Minister of Foreign Affairs, talking about 
to preventing uh, human smuggling and trying to structure a system that according to them already um, taking root. Uh, they're trying to bring some structure to that now, officially. I mean, there's a bunch of madness, if you ask me. It's, it's, a, it's a bunch really, of madness. I rarely listen to you, Don. I don't think he makes much sense. Sorry I said that publicly, but I... <laughs> you might be expressing the thoughts of, of lots of, of guys. I want to pull exactly what he said, because, you know, I'm trying to reconcile, maybe can be reconciled, um, one, they talk about uh, us getting uh, the country getting the green light, or at least the agency rather, the recruitment agency getting the green light for this, uh, these 700 persons. Um, and then I'm, I'm trying to head to my notes where it says, um, you know, this, this, this uh, stuff that talk, talks about here, um, you know, them trying to fill this gap and um, what they're seeing happening and so on. Uh, in, like it's on every front, it's a very, very um, short sightage. Oh, they want to um, prevent human trafficking and abuse of the process. So this this letter of authorization, this uh, employment agency seeks to do that. I guess what, I, I, I don't think they said, I don't know who wrote it, but I think what he was trying to suggest is that they want one authorized agency or one um, company dealing with it so persons would know that if it is that they want to come, this is the avenue. And any other avenue would be seen as some other ulterior motive of trying to get in the country outside of this. But what comes with it is also, who exactly is this company? Where did this company come from? Who is in charge of this company? Who's in control of this company? Those are questions we have to ask to figure out what really may be going on behind the scenes where this is concerned. And until we have all the answers, I have a lot of questions as to why. Because if it is in the last two to three years, I know almost 500 nurses have left the system. What did the Minister of Health do to ensure that they reduce that? What did the Minister of Health do to, to speak to those nurses to find out what caused them to leave the system and what it would cause for them to come back? What have they done to reduce the number of nurses leaving? Nurses are leaving every day. Teachers are leaving. Nurses are leaving because of them. So Frank didn't even have to find out. You know, you had Asha Kesul on one of our better days in National Assembly. She talked about the struggles of the doctors in the system that we have. And she was, you know, channeling what her colleagues told her, you know, the, and she's a doctor herself, but she knows to be true. We had a lot of struggle. And then, you know, Frank, uh, you know, talked to them and said, oh, when we come in, 50% vote for us. And now when they come in, it's another story. They told the teachers the same thing, and now they're saying, oh, they, they, they're already earning at a high end of the spectrum. These are our teachers. And so yeah. there is no fiscal space for them to get anything more. This is the lying government that we have. You know, put it frankly. It's just sick. It's just, and, and, and it will affect our health system. It will affect, affect our education system because the teachers are leaving. I, I was also told a lot of the good police are leaving the system. And so we end up in with, with most of our sectors, um, the people are leaving the system and then we try to figure out why it is that when we call the police, nobody shows up or the people who show yeah. up, you wish they didn't. Well, that's another possibility because if we could be importing nurses, why we can't import policemen? Oh, no. You know, Bangladeshi please, please, policemen, you know, please, come please, to your please, door please. call the police. You see three, three foreigners speaking a different language here. You. Please don't you know, give them any idea. That says the hiring is not limited to the Bangladeshis alone. So who knows? Tenants in your own country. And while this is happening, folks, you know, we try to start your Mondays a little light, but so much happened over, over the over the long weekend. A building went up in flames yesterday at Linda and a Chinese national perished in that blaze. I think four persons are homeless. Now, Tavi, a second ago, you were talking about the fact that you got so many questions more than answers in this country. One of the questions we got such a small population, you know, there's about 16 of us here that is me, you, and your family. And all of these fires you see on a daily basis. I mean, like, what's what's going on here? And this is just one of many for the month. Yeah, you know, one see, of and, and this is what I see think is the issue here. If it is that you recognize that a lot of fires are happening, what is it what is the cause for the fires? Is it electrical issue? Is it a case that our electrical um, systems in our homes are, have gone bad over the years and so we need new, we need to rewire our systems? 
or are there other issues that, that need assistance? And so the fire service can come in. I have not seen the fire, the firemen do try to do as much as they can, as best as they can once they get on the scene. Um, but I think there needs to be a plan, a strategic plan for the fire service, which includes going into communities and having a plan that says, okay, let me check your homes. Let us check um, what how, how it is that you're dealing with the equipment in your home. So you have a so Guyanese get a sense of what is required to keep their home safe from fire. And then if they need to get fire insurance, if they can, they also do that so that if something happens, they can also be able to rebuild in a short space of time. But there is nothing like that in place. You just see right. fires going up and up and all. The, 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 the minister that's in charge of the, what do you want to call his name, in charge of the fire service, comes on the scene, berate the fireman for not having on the right clothes, but puts no system in place to ensure that they reduce the amount of fires that, people, uh, that, that happens in our society. And I think we need yep. to do better. And all it calls for is a proper strategic plan. What is happening? Why is it happening? How can we deal with it? Go into the communities and get it done. All If you go into South, for example, you go in, look at the houses, say, well, you know what? We, you need to rewire. And then the government can have a proper plan in place. We have so much money, natural resources, but instead of just spending it on 600 boxes of food for an event that only 200 people are coming to, Put a system, you don't know where that comes from, but <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. Put systems in place so that persons can get some monies if they need to rewire their homes, if they need a fire extinguisher. And so you so that people are feeling a bit more safe in their homes, but then there's no plan that tries to deal with our fire issue and it will continue because there's nothing that is helping people understand the cause and how they can deal with it. Correct, correct, correct. So there's the fire on the one side that we're contending with, and then we have the road accidents. It's like we, we have the trifecta of issues. The violence against women and girls would be the other one that we grapple with as a country all the time. Just so we can, Tabitha, um, like you don't know where to begin in the education sector here. you got to educate people on, uh, on, on, on health and safety, uh, on the work sites, in, in you know, uh, safety in the homes, where concerns prior road usage is another area. Um, you know, just going through this over the weekend, I had to sign out a little bit and come back because I realized I can spoil the whole the whole pack with the as I was trying to um, you know come up to come up to par with where we were on our dashboard with all of these fires, and it's quite something. You know, and, and, and road accidents too. Um, let me just give you a, a little sense of what we're talking about. Uh, on the 22nd, which was what? 22nd was, was, was Friday? Was it? Yes. Yeah, I think so. On the 22nd, there was a, there, there was a road accident at Zealot. Right? Um, in which a sheriff-owned car, sheriff security-owned car, um ran over a man who was lying on the carpet don't know why he was in the carpet but this is uh his name is uh warren jr farmers from the william there was that on the 22nd folks help me was let, let, let me double check in my end friday 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 what day was friday yep yes yeah, yeah, was it, yeah, it's the 22nd. Was it? yeah friday was the 22nd that that was friday at the william you know Yep, Region 3, right? And then on the 23rd, which is Saturday, on Letem Public Road, Kemel Laverna Lindy lost her life. 48, woman, 48 years old, um, was just trying to cross the road there. Now, Letem is not a tremendously uh, busy, high-paced environment. When you're losing your life in a road without it, Letem, you know, you must know where we are as a country. Something is wrong in this country. That was at Letem, Shemel, right? At, um, at Harbira, right? Am I calling it right? H-I-B-E-N-I-A. Back street in Essequibo. 26-year-old, Danish Williams, lost his life there. His motorcycle crashed in, um, ended up into a trench. And I think he was pinned, Danish Williams. Right? Or high high Hibernia Street S Right? Back Street says it all. Back Street. 
you're killing yourself on the back street, right? There was an accident on the yesterday at Bushlot. Karen Dur Durman, 17 years old, a painter, lost control of his motorcycle too. And that is another feature in all these accidents that we are seeing. Motorcycles at the top of the pyramid, right? So Karen uh, Durman, 17 years old, at Bushla in Babis. Yesterday morning as well, Cummins and Church Street. Colonel Husband's 45-year-old security uh, officer lost his life as a car. They said breached the stoplight there and collided with his motorcycle. His motorcycle ended up being pinned under that vehicle. Uh, just over the weekend, uh, you know, it's just death, world fatalities, carnage, and airborne promise. When the year started, I could see him now in his um, in his black and white tux. He said, we're going to engage in national conversation on the strategy and this carnage on our road. Tabitha, nope. The carnage continues unabated. Uh, yeah, well, um, as you were speaking, Sherrod, something came to me and it's sad, but it's the reality that we live in. Um, the, the, our, it stems from our education system. The lack of proper curricula in our education system and the fact that we are not um, ensuring that the majority of our young people stay through the system until a high school and graduate um, and get the type of education that is not just not that saying that maths, English, science is important, but also civic responsibility and those sort of education as well. You will see people end up as adults, really not understanding how to be in a civilized society. And so it's all about uh, my individual needs, where I want to go, how fast I want to get there. Um, not really looking out for others, um, thinking about others before yourself. And so that is happening at all level of uh, levels of our society, from the top right down. And so what we end up with is carnage on our roadways, fires that are happening, and nobody seems to think that they need to put systems in place to try to stop it, to reduce it. Um, uh, there's domestic violence, gender-based violence at all levels, because we're not sure. Basically, our young men and women have not been taught on how it is that you interact with each other. When things go wrong, how do you respond in situations? There's no conversation that is national that is happening about this. Yes, something happens and then you see somebody take out a picture, said, yes, they had some meeting with five people or they had some certificate to give 10 people something. But there is no proper national conversation happening on these things. And so the majority of people don't know that 20 persons got a certificate in gender-based violence. And so yep. it continues and so if our education system does not take stock of the fact that what they have um, sent into the society are people who really do not understand how to live with each other, um, uh, look out for each other, and, and, and deal with circumstances and situations when challenges arise, then we have to go back to our education system and see what needs to be changed. Because it will just continue in the different sectors in different forms, and it may get worse as the time go by. And so I think we really need to take stock as a society as to where we are, what it is we're lacking, and figure out what it is that we need to do to curb it for the adults and to ensure it doesn't um, continue with our children that are now coming up in the system. Yep, yep, yep. Um, I see somebody said here, knowing how they are, no stone left unturned, you know? No stone left unturned. Uh, folks, it's so much, it's so much, you know, happened over the last few days. We were off. We we're just trying to catch up uh, to some of it at this end. And uh, look, one of the other issues that we, we're tackling this morning. Uh, that there is already a hospital not too far away, not too far off. Right. But there's a there's another hospital, a, a regional hospital being built in Bushland. Of course, you know, there's a regional hospital already at um, at what is that area there in, in Region 5? Tap the folks help me. I know y'all are sharp. I'm seeing it in my mind's eye. What is the area there? Right. Uh, quite close. Fort Wellington Hospital. Yeah. Oh, yes. Uh, not not so far away. 
right? Fort Wellington, not so far away. And now this one in Bath. Look, if, I guess if you have the money, you could build one in every community. But that being said, another feature we've seen locally is everything running behind schedule. Mm -hmm. right? This hospital now has fallen behind schedule like so many other projects that we're seeing happening. And we we know what's going to happen here. If we're going to land on the ground, views out, views out, uh, followed by um, one edge, views out, views out, views out, and then they can get them some more time and some more money. That's what you can see happening. Tabitha, right? In Parliament, it, over the years, uh, a lot of our MPs have been saying that that is what will happen. Because before there was the oil money, it was obvious that our ability to um, utilize the funds and to get projects done was already very limited. And so if you increase the amount of projects, if you increase the amount of construction, and you do nothing to ensure that you raise capacity, that you ensure that, you know, put, you put systems in place to, to ensure that you actually... Um, and don't run behind time, then it will just increase. And so that's what we see. What we said that from day one, when the first water came, we said that this is what will continue to happen. And a lot, a great percentage of the money will be uh, end up in corruption. Uh, you know, a lot of it will be lost. Um, a lot of it will end up in somebody's pocket and the work will just not get done. Um, and that is what we see happening throughout the length and breadth of this country. But the, the, they are striving that by 2025, it must look like a different country. So they could see, look, we build this, we build that, we build this road. And then five months later, the road are already breaking up. Nobody in the hospitals, even though you have 20 across the country, because you don't have capacity um, so that you can have the, the requisite nurses and doctors in the hospitals. Or you end up with um, 700 persons from Bangladesh and Cuba and wherever else um, coming to, to man the hospitals. Uh, and so it's it's... It's a crazy approach to development and governance. It's a very crazy, it's a, a haphazard approach. It's an approach without any sense of proper planning, any sense of, 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 of proper, like, it's like, like basic common sense seem to like be far, you know, like God decided not to give them any basic common sense. Because I don't understand how you could look at something and say, well, you know what? This hasn't worked before, but somehow, because we have more money, it will just work now. And you know you don't have yeah. the capacity. You know you put no such systems in place to ensure that things function better. But some of it will just happen. And everybody will just be happy to see another hospital with no drugs inside and no proper beds and no proper um, persons to actually deal with the health care and the health issues of the citizens. We'll see what happens. But I think Guyanese know um, what they will get from the PP. The majority of Guyanese uh, are not lost in the fact that more concrete structures are going up because at the end of the day, they still can't eat, they still can't get proper health care, they still have a lot of issues in the education system, and a lot of persons are looking for private education to deal with the issues in the public health care system, health um, education system. And so Chinese know that PP is bad for business, bad for the country, bad as yeah. governors, and all levels. Yeah. You know, Tabitha, as, as you said, I, I remember... Uh, seeing a friend over the weekend, I think it was on Saturday, uh, coming down from Barbies. Now, if you see the entourage, you wouldn't think this country is in the state that it's in. You know, Air Force entourage has grown for about 10 years, about 50 now. You know, when you see them coming through, I said, this is the king of Zimundo here, boy. You know, and this country, it's it, it bursting at the seams with issues and, and troubles and problems. One of those that we following this morning... I think the final thing we can touch on, because we're running out of time here, is so much happened over the weekend. The Soku scam. Now, this is the editorial out of today's uh, Sabbath News, I think. In the Sabbath News, just send me the check, the man. Oh, shucks. You know, all this PR that we give you. Send us the check, Sabbath News. Um, talking about the Soku scam. When we don't know police from TV in a bad way, we're in a bad way. Tell me, I'm certain you heard, like, uh, members of the public listening to us this morning. Of these policemen who impersonated Soku officers, uh, trying to um, trying to roll, as we say locally, trying to get some money out of a businessman of some sort. They were asking him, for, telling him that he was involved in some fraud matter, and to make the matter go away, he had to pay a million dollars. I wonder how many people, you know, are paid in this country to make matters go away. The editorial header is the Soku scam. We're in a bad way. We're in a bad way as a country. 
what makes two officers in the right thinking mind if they have that thing that they could go and do this was was this is your first outing tabby Vashti, mavis davis well andrew sharon costello was this their first outing i don't think so Tabby. I, I i i don't think so either but it's that's I, basically what i was saying before you 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 when it is a their education system is the way it is. And you have people in leadership who seem not to care about the type of people we are developing as a society. Then these things will happen and happen in abundance, especially if at the top, there's there's no um, indication that if it is that you in, involved in anything such as um, fraud or anything to try to um, blackmail or so persons that you will, you know, that you will be held accountable then persons feel that they ha have the liberty to do whatever comes into their head to get monies uh, when they are in dire need. <laughs> and so that is what we see happening, and it's happening at all levels from the top right down. And so it, 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 is, it is sad, but you cannot expect better based on the culture of those who are leading. That's, that's the bottom line. I actually, <laughs> Cheryl, just got a message from someone about the fact that their, their teachers are leaving that they're putting systems in their, their teachers in the United States that are basically helping teachers in Guyana along the process so that they can, their applications can be filed and so that they can leave us quite soon to go other places, greener pastures as we call it, to, um, yeah. to teach. And they're leaving in droves. And so as, as horrible as our um, public education system is now, and not because of the teachers, but because of the structure of the system. Um, it is going to get worse. It's going to get worse. And um, I do not know what, whether or not we will have persons from Bangladesh and Cuba teaching in our classrooms as well, because they seem to have no other um, way of dealing with the issues that our professionals are leaving our country in droves because they're not being paid and the conditions of work are just horrible because the PP has decided that they prefer not to pay our public servants what they deserve. Yeah, we, we, we're, in, <laughs> we're in quite quite a bad way, um, you know, from what's happening in the police force, uh, we, you know, what's happening in every sector in this country. You every sector. Pick a sector. Right? And they can come and tell you all kind of fancy so but the reality is what people are telling us. You know, one thing that comes across um, everything in this country, people want betterment for the family. Now, how I can tell a nurse, stay in struggle with me. Exactly. Right? Stay in the struggle. It can be better tomorrow. People want betterment today. That's when people want it. You know, we, we punish all these years. We punish and we, we come through, we come through, we come through. And then you see, oh God, we win all this, this big lotto. You know, this big lotto is oil and gas. And you think it's nice time now. And even so, you know, dream deferred. You got to hold on until 2027 April. But the thing is, what are you holding? What, what, what is the rationale behind holding on? I'm trying to understand it because I'm sitting here and I'm thinking, they are saying they don't have the fiscal space to give public servants more money but they're injecting billions of dollars into the system through the contracts. That is money going into our economy through a different route. So this fiscal space that they're talking about is only for public servants because public servants apparently, fiscal space is different from the, the money that they're paying the contractors um, to do the work. Billions of dollars on a, any given day. And so that, that line that they're taking that they don't have the fiscal space, it's, it, it, it's flawed and it's it's an I pass the guy needs to understand what is going on. And if it is that you have the fiscal space to give contractors billions of dollars in advance who can't even finish their work and you have public servants working day in and day out to keep the system afloat, a system that you really do not care for, but they are they're struggling, putting their little pennies together to try to ensure that the students have what they need in the classroom. When, when they can't when when they this when the students can't afford it to give them some breakfast when they realize that the students are hungry and you're looking at those teachers in the face and say they don't deserve more but you could give your friend billions of dollars on any given day to, 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 to do a road because the road is more important than the students in the classroom I think we need to see it for what it is yeah 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 we're in a bad way folks I want to recommend to you 
that type of news editorial, the so-called scam for um, your, your, your homework, for um, recommended and required reading, you know? Stop it, send me the check, you know? Send me the check. <laughs> please, please and thank you. Folks, we're going to leave it there for this morning. Uh, we just opened our mark and we are 9.43 in. Uh, this new day, this new Tuesday, is a lot happening, folks. And we're going to have it all for you on the next broadcast. So glad seeing Elizabeth Norine on the live. Edward Brooms here, Maxine Monroe, Lyndon Gill, Sharon Castello, uh, Debbie Collins, all your favorite people, Tabitha. I don't know if you can see these names from your end. I, I really can't. Right? <laughs> but uh, clearly you've been gone for too long. Welcome back, Tabby. Welcome back. Like, hey, Sharon, and the here. <laughs> we'll make it better for tomorrow. But I <laughs> thank you for being with us. Um, I'm seeing some, oh, Andrew Griffith, Beryl Crawford. Lyndon Gill, Gwyneth Anderson, Gail Alicock. Good morning. I hope you guys have a good day. I hope. Um, uh, then you feel better when you shout them out. It's not important, <laughs> my name. I hear all the time tarry with them since you come. <laughs> nice time. <laughs> hope you guys have a good day today. I hope um, that what we would have discussed this morning piqued your interest and help you to understand things a bit better as to what is going on in our society. Um, because we need yeah. to keep abreast uh, with what is happening so that when we have conversations with others who may not be tuned into the program to help them to understand exactly where we are as a country and why it is we need to be involved, get involved and don't stay on the sidelines because it would be to our detriment if we do that. All right, Dr. Ewart Hakim Benjamin, I, we see you there. Debbie Collins, <laughs> um, Everett Leonard and all the other folks. Have a great day, Wenda and uh, Stacey and Soul, Marilyn Thomas. Boss man, good to see you too and all the others joining us this morning. That's going to do it for us at this end. That's our time, folks.